Bosnia was the first of the Soviet republics to declare its independence in 1990. Today, the capital, Vilnius, is a thriving center of economic development. But dig beneath the surface, and icy fingers reach up out of a dark past. You can see here the old building, old type buildings, and new one. Arturis Zouokas is mayor of Vilnius. We are on the crossroads between different uh, countries. And in uh, Vilnius, we have been occupied by Polish army, Swedish, French, uh, Russian, Soviet, and other armies. This is how so to say some unique of our history. After the Soviet occupation of Lithuania ended, workers at a former Soviet military base unearthed a shocking discovery. One that the construction foreman will never forget. I saw that these bones were definitely human bones. So I called the police and stopped the whole work. In a mass grave, hundreds, thousands of victims. But who are they? And who was the killer? Dr. Remantis Jankowskis, a forensic anthropologist at Vilnius University, is called in to oversee the excavation. With more than 2,000 skeletons to identify, it's every forensic anthropologist's dream and worst nightmare. I'm a little bit scared. As you see, they are so intermingled with each other. Eight years ago, Jankowskis excavated another mass grave. By matching photographs of known Soviet dissidents to the skeletal remains, he identified them as KGB victims. This pit is only half a mile from the KGB site. It makes the Soviets the prime suspect here too. But something doesn't add up. This time, there is no smoking gun. There is relatively few artifacts on all the five no weapons, very few coins, and very few military insignias. Before burial, bodies were partially stripped of their clothing and decades of decay have conspired to conceal the last shreds of incriminating evidence. Then, a single button from a vanished uniform, a tantalizing clue to the identity of the victim. There is a small trace of decoration just getting around on the rim, but you cannot see much on, on the front, front part of, of the button. <clears throat> When the buttons are cleaned, archaeologists positively identify their source. It plunges them back in time to the mightiest army in European history. An awesome force under the total control of a single extraordinary man. More books have been written about Napoleon Bonaparte than the number of days that have passed since his death. And still he amazes. Napoleon is not even French. He's a one-time artillery lieutenant from the island of Corsica. But by 35, he has crowned himself Emperor of France. And he's Europe's reigning workaholic. Driven by near-manic energy, Napoleon barks out separate military commands to three scribes at once. But he also knows when to turn off the heat and turn on the charm. He once told a friend, when I need anyone, I don't make too fine a point about it. I would kiss his ass. Did this five foot six inch military genius have a Napoleon complex? If you mean did he think he was the most powerful man on earth, the answer is yes. But by 1812, with all Europe under his control, well, who was going to argue with him? Five years before, Napoleon and the Tsar of Russia had signed an alliance against England. Napoleon's arch enemy. 
But the Tsar has broken it by continuing to trade with England. Now, for Napoleon, it's payback time. Conquest has made me what I am, and conquest alone can maintain me. For two years, he plans the invasion of Russia. Gifted with a photographic memory, Napoleon maps out his conquest down to the nitty-gritty. He personally designs the supply wagons, frets over the number of horseshoes to bring, and the exact amount of food each soldier carries with him. But while his conscious mind plots cold-blooded strategy, his subconscious betrays his fears. Napoleon is haunted by a recurring nightmare, according to this account by his valet. The memory of this dream followed him a very long while. He often spoke of it, each time trying to extract different deductions from it. Napoleon admits he's rattled. A bear was ripping open my chest, he says, and tearing my heart out. In the dream, he's being attacked by a bear, the symbol of Russian might. Reality check. Instead of a bear, the real Russian ruler, Tsar Alexander, seems more like a pussycat. The Tsar can't stand the sight of blood. Addicted to the pleasures of the Russian court, he's scorned as grandmother's spoiled pet. But the Tsar conceals a darker side. He's so cunning and two-faced, he has been called the Sphinx. It's even whispered that he had a hand in the murder of his own father. But to Napoleon, he looks like a pushover. Pitted against the greatest military genius of his time, the Tsar has fought only one battle in his life and lost. The invasion of Russia looks like a slam dunk. By June 1812, Napoleon gathers the largest army Europe has ever seen. 650,000 men, 140,000 horses, countless supply wagons carry 28 million bottles of wine and his personal gold dinner service. As one of the earliest historians of the campaign said, everything was there to inebriate a great genius uh, on his own power. Historian Paul Britton Austin has analyzed Napoleon's mindset. He thought he was going to have a short, sharp, good war and a good battle, as he called it. His soldiers intend to ride his coattails to another glorious victory. They just worshipped the ground that Napoleon walked on. He was the new god, quite simply. They even used the word of him. They set out towards the River Neman at the Lithuanian border. One of his generals proclaims, The word Neman inflamed our imagination. Everybody was on fire to get across it. But who are these soldiers willing to lay down their lives for the man they call le patron, the boss? So, children, I can make an order that this is a male. From the 1,700 skeletons examined so far, Dr. Jankowskis has put together a startling portrait of Napoleon's invasion force. An illustrative majority was prevailing young males, 20 to 25 years. Just few of them, less than 10%, were younger than 20. But some of them are as young as 15 years. The research bears out what historians had long suspected. After 16 years of nonstop war, Napoleon has been forced to draft tens of thousands of raw recruits. Accounts reveal that no one was more worried about it than Napoleon himself. I find these men too young. What I need is people who can stand fatigue. And men who are too young only fill the hospital. Napoleon holds the army's doctors responsible for the condition of his men. When he meets an artillery surgeon, Edouard Deschis, 
Napoleon grills him on the health of the troops. Êtes-vous le docteur à l'hôpital d'Insterbourg? Then he sees the doctor has brought his son with him. Monsieur, cet enfant devrait The boy should be in school, he growls. The startled doctor replies that he hadn't expected to come so far from France. Anyone who belongs to the army, says Napoleon, should be prepared for anything. Napoleon thinks he's prepared for anything Russia can throw at him. He reassures his generals he will polish off the Tsar in less than two months, long before the dreaded chill of the Russian winter. His first obstacle, the Niemen River. For Napoleon, it's a no-brainer. He has brought with him a high-tech solution, pontoons specially designed by the finest engineers in Europe. June 23, 1812 the night before the invasion. Napoleon personally scouts the ideal place to bridge the Niemen River. But suddenly, he's dealt a wild card. In this case, a wild hare. <coughs> a close aide, General Calencourt, observes his reaction. He affected the utmost serenity and did all he could to banish the gloomy doubt no one could help feeling. But his officers are more shaken up than Napoleon is. Instantly, the reflection occurred to me that it was a bad augury. <coughs> Nor was I the only one to think so. For the prince of Neuchâtel seized my hand and said, we'd better not cross the Niemen. This is a bad omen. June 24th, 1812. Napoleon's crossing of the Niemen River happens like clockwork. In three days, half a million men with their horses and wagons ford the river. Not a single life is lost. It looks like the bad omens are just water under the bridge. The concentration of 10 armies on the Niemen on one and the same day was an astounding feat of logistics, even for a man who was all powerful and he must have been feeling very pleased with himself. Now an intelligence report indicates the Russian ruler is in Vilnius, capital of Lithuania, only a few days' ride away. Napoleon seizes the moment. The French outnumber the Russians three to one. Napoleon figures sheer numbers will bully the Tsar to the peace table. But when the first reports trickle in from Vilnius, he's stunned. The Russians have fled the city. The Tsar has given him the slip. When Napoleon's army came to Vilnius, many of Vilnius citizens at that time had been quite happy because uh, the Napoleon army kicked out the Russians. And uh, they looked to the Napoleon as a hero. June 28, 1812. In Vilnius, the Lithuanians roll out the red carpet. The troops revel in the moment, proof the old Napoleon magic still works. One soldier, Victor Dupuis, writes, We are welcomed with the most joyous acclamations. The ladies in their party dresses were throwing down flowers and biscuits to us. But Napoleon is in no mood to pop open the champagne. He had hoped for a quick knockout punch. Now the Tsar has slipped through his fingers. In fury, he storms to the archbishop's palace. He enters the very room where the Tsar stayed only the day before. Napoleon doesn't have long to wait. His aide brings in a message from the Tsar. Tsar Alexander tells Napoleon, go back across the Niemen River, then we'll talk. Napoleon is enraged that the Russian ruler doesn't realize he's licked. Napoleon summons Count Balashov, the Tsar's emissary, and throws a major fit. 
My forces are three times as big as yours, he says. Aren't you ashamed? With all Europe behind me, how can you resist me? Balashov politely replies, we'll do our best, sire. So he is warned, but uh, he just dismissed this as a lot of rhetoric. Napoleon orders his men after the Tsar with a vengeance. His troops are more cocky than ever. As one of his captains boasts, we could have been asked to conquer the moon, and we would have responded with forward march. To Napoleon, Vilnius is little more than a consolation prize. But while he hunts down the Tsar, he has no intention of leaving his trophy at risk. Napoleon set up a provisional puppet government here in Vilnius, whom he gave instructions, one of which was to dig trenches bon chance. to prevent the city being suddenly seized by some uh, Russian foray in his absence. Uh, and it's these trenches that uh, almost certainly are where the mass grave is today. Napoleon's Grand Army sets off on the heels of the retreating Russian troops. Their mission, to catch the Tsar before he escapes deep into Russia. There are a couple of his vertebrae, backbones, that have traces of fractures from pressure. Dr. Jankowskis found evidence of the French soldier's grueling pace. This is a case of so-called marsh food. That happened from heavy physical load. Bones were breaking because of tiredness. The forensic evidence confirms reports that the French soldiers set a blistering pace, up to 25 miles a day, carrying 60 pound packs. And scientists were puzzled to find something else that the remains of Napoleon's soldiers had in common. The most fascinating find for us was when you put lower jaw and upper jaw together. Mm -hmm. It's like, like a cleft. Cleft among teeth. The strange notch was seen in the teeth of numerous skeletons, but no one knew what it meant until Jankowskis tried slipping something into the slot. So working hour lasts for 50 minutes, and the rest, 10 minutes, is rest of smoking rest. And he was not wasting his time and just loved to smoke his pipe. A smoke might offer a welcome break from the grueling march. But nothing can bring relief from the fierce Russian climate, according to weather expert David Rhine. Russia has one of the most extreme climates in the world. The vast size of the Asian landmass and its isolation from warm ocean currents create a climate that is lethal in winter, brutal in summer. At the beginning, you had heat exhaustion. You had dehydration. During the first part of the campaign, the weather was hot and it was dry. You had exhaustion. You had rainstorms that muddied the roads up and caused uh, wagons to be left behind and to collapse and soldiers to be stuck. As the campaign continued, you began to have diseases. With their supply wagons bogged down far behind them, the French must live off the land. But the Russian Cossacks torch everything in their path. The scorched earth policy certainly of what was a, a, a very nasty blow. It wasn't the, the peasants who burnt down their own villages heroically or anything like that, but it was the Cossacks who were the Tsar's police, as it were, who drove them out, burnt down their villages and their crops. Even Napoleon's most loyal officers see trouble ahead. All his generals begged him not to go any further. You see, he couldn't. He had, as one says, he had the wolf by the throat. You can't let go of it because it'll bite you. And so he had to go on. Too stubborn to turn back, 
Napoleon spends three months chasing the Tsar's army across Russia towards Moscow. Intelligence reports indicate the Tsar is in the Russian capital to supervise its defense. He knew quite a bit about the Russian landscape before he went in there. The road to Moscow from Europe follows the high ground. This high ground was created by ancient glaciers. And this is a traditional invasion route. Hitler followed this route in World War II. And it's the same route that Napoleon followed when he invaded in 1812. This 800-mile trek isn't what his army bargained for, especially not the soldiers who had been conscripted against their will. Desertion became a very big problem. Half of Napoleon's army came from countries that he had conquered. And the minute things got tough, they got going. The troops that don't desert soon fall prey to diseases like typhus and dysentery. No physical evidence of those diseases has been found in their remains. But the bones reveal clues to another dreaded scourge that some of the troops carried with them. This is frontal bone. It's from head, forehead. This is from this area. Yeah, this area. And here are scars of chronic inflammation that are typical and clear signs of syphilis. Dr. Jankowskis has found evidence that supports accounts that women may have traveled with the soldiers. A certain number of females were accompanying the army, like a washerwoman, like a cooks, like a petty tradesman and so on, also other services, including sexual services. Racked by disease and desertion, Napoleon's forces have lost the numerical advantage. September 6th, 1812. At last, Napoleon gets his wish. He catches up with the Russian army at Borodino, a village 70 miles outside of Moscow. But instead of a three-to-one advantage for the French army, the balance has shifted. The Russians now have a slight edge. Both sides have their backs to the wall. The troops in the French army, they all knew that they must not be defeated because they were 2,000 miles from France. The Russians were determined to stand and, and uh, fight more for the honor of Russia than anything else to stop the French getting into Moscow. Before the battle, Tsar Alexander sends an appeal to his troops. Defend Mother Russia from the unholy invaders. The blood of the valorous Slavs runs in your veins. Warriors, you are defending religion, our country, and freedom. I am with you. According to one of Napoleon's officers, his men have very different motives. They know no other divinity than their sovereign, no other reason but force, no other passion but glory. They have pinned everything on Napoleon. Now he's literally under the weather. At least that's the diagnosis of his personal physician. He was tormented by the winds, by the mist, the rain, and the atmosphere. Yeah. According to one account, Napoleon complains that he's growing old, his legs are swelling, and he has trouble urinating. He blames it all on the humid weather. He was a very, very sick man, not lethally sick, but very ill. And any uh, uh, of our uh, viewers would have wanted to fight a battle in that state of mind. At dawn, a quarter million men do battle. The fighting is intense. An estimated three cannon shots per second, 430 musket rounds a minute for 10 long, bloody hours. The Russians are about to crack. But to defeat them, it will mean Napoleon has to risk his personal troops, the Imperial Guard. He's eyeball to eyeball with the enemy. For the first time in his life, Napoleon blinks. He refused to send in the guard because he said, what if there's another battle tomorrow? Now, the young Bonaparte wouldn't have said that. This was the crux of the thing. He would have known it. The Battle of Borodino is the bloodiest in history. 74,000 casualties in a single day. 
That's over three times the total casualties on D-Day in World War II. And all for what? Napoleon arrives at the gates of Moscow. According to tradition, he should be presented the keys to the city. But don't hold your breath. No keys were brought. He was extremely mortified. They marched into the city, and to their amazement, they found it empty. That same night, September 15, 1812, Napoleon faces an astonishing sight. The city of Moscow, engulfed in flames. He's even more amazed when he learns who did it. The Russians themselves, working on orders from the city's governor. One account records Napoleon's outrage. This is a war of extermination. To burn down one's own cities. A demon inspires these people. The fires destroy four-fifths of Moscow and much of the food stored within its walls. Napoleon sends urgent peace initiatives to the Tsar in St. Petersburg. For five weeks, he waits for a response. But all Napoleon hears is the ominous ticking of the clock. The Russian weather is an enemy he can neither charm nor bully, and each day, his window of escape is narrow. Napoleon's generals like to boast that there is no such word as retreat in the French army's dictionary. But on October 19th, 1812, Napoleon uses the R word. The retreat from Moscow begins. <clears throat> Take off your hat. Napoleon leaves the gates of Moscow behind. A close advisor later observed. Fortune had so long showered him with favors that he could not believe she had now deserted him. For months, he has chased after the Tsar's forces. Now, for the first time, the tables are turned. Napoleon is the hunted one. His ruthless enemy has a name. The Russians call it General Winter. Napoleon's men set out from Moscow in a race against time. But they are slowed down by the weight of their own greed. In the Vilnius mass grave, Dr. Jankowskis found evidence of the heavy price Napoleon's soldiers paid during the march away from Moscow. There are a couple of vertebrae, backbones, that have traces of fractures from pressure. It was carrying something very heavy for long distances. They brought all this stuff and nothing like the food they would need to march 500 miles back to Vilnius. Soon, all they carry with them is hunger and exhaustion. With the French troops weak and demoralized, Russian Cossacks move in like hungry wolves for the kill. Cossacks ambush the emperor's personal guard. Suddenly, Napoleon finds himself the target. General Philippe de Ségur, his aide, who survived the attack, writes, If these wretched fellows hadn't yelled so as they attacked, as they always do to dull their minds to the danger, perhaps Napoleon wouldn't have escaped them. <laughs> that night, Napoleon takes drastic steps to make sure he'll never be captured alive. He has his physician prepare a lethal dose of fast-acting poison. Some experts believe it was opium mixed with belladonna. He will carry it with him from now on, just in case. The promise of swift and certain death.
like the poison he now carries with him. The Russian weather afflicts Napoleon like a curse. Just how extreme is the climate? We're talking the coldest temperatures outside of Antarctica. And if you think that's bad, it just gets worse. Because this year, winter comes early. In the winter, you have created here something called a Siberian high pressure system. That high pressure system forces air down and out in all directions. So temperatures around Moscow are much colder in wintertime than they are in the European continent. Even against this formidable enemy, Napoleon refuses to admit defeat. An aide reports. It seemed as if the emperor were expecting some miracle to alter the climate and end the ruin that was descending on us from every side. Alas, the emperor deluded himself, and our ruin followed on his misfortune. A ruin that rips the famed French esprit de corps to shreds. Total anarchy descends on the troops. The whole thing fell to pieces, and the egoism, the selfishness, it terrified and horrified the army. With all hope gone, some choose to end their misery. An eyewitness recalls. Hundreds of men, feeling they could no longer endure such hardships, killed themselves. Every day, we heard isolated shots ring out in the woods. Patrols sent to investigate always came back to report. It's a Frenchman who's just blown his brains out. Temperatures sink to 30 below zero. The new enemy is hypothermia. In an effort to generate heat, the victim's body shivers uncontrollably. Blood stops circulating to the arms and legs. In the final stages of hypothermia, delirium seizes hold. The victim feels a flush of warmth, an overwhelming urge to lie down in the snow to sleep. They start uh, staggering about as if they were drunk. Uh, they fall out of the column. Some might start laughing or something, and then they just pitch fall flat on their faces. Lots of these people were from the Mediterranean area. They are absolutely not prepared for that, not prepared biologically. Within a month of leaving Moscow, over half of Napoleon's men have died. General Kalenko, Napoleon's right-hand man, confides, never did a battlefield present so much horror. The cavalry have been forced to butcher their own horses for food. Now even the officers must walk out of Russia. November 9, 1812. To show support for the troops, Napoleon dismounts and marches beside them. But according to one soldier, his gesture of sympathy backfires. I weep to see our emperor marching on foot, a stick in his hand. He who is so great, who has made us so proud. For weeks, the soldiers' only hope has been to reach Vilnius with its promise of food, shelter, and safety. At the gates of Vilnius today, historian Paul Britton Austin relives the moment. Stunned, freezing, starving, at the very end of their tether, or indeed far beyond it. And uh, they were hoping, if they still had anything left to hope for, that Vilnius would be a safe haven where the retreat, this endless and terrible retreat, would finally end. But as they approach the city, the temperature plummets to its coldest yet. The temperatures were so cold that Napoleon's aide de camp reported birds falling from the sky. So cold that the breath from the humans literally just hung in the air like ice crystals and ice fog. One eyewitness reports. In a little under a league and a half, 58 corpses. Wow. Finally, after marching for a month and a half, 
What's left of Napoleon's grand army catches sight of Vilnius, their last hope for a sanctuary. Of Napoleon's once mighty force of half a million that left Vilnius, only 20,000 returned. Even now, many of his men still cling to the hope that their leader will save them. They're out of luck. Napoleon is no coward, but he's got his own agenda. He's off to Paris to deliver his spin on the Russian disaster. The French are like women, he says. You must not stay away from them too long. Napoleon had beat it for Paris. Eight days it took him to get to Paris. Nobody had ever crossed Europe that quickly before, but the purpose was to get there before the news got there. Soon, news reaches Napoleon's men that he has abandoned them. What effect his uh, departure had on his uh, troops, we get different accounts of. It, it's an extraordinary, but one thing that all these people say is that though they curse their officers and they curse the weather and they curse, curse the Russians, nobody ever heard anybody curse Napoleon. A French captain recalls the impact of the moment. As long as he'd stuck with us, our total confidence in him had helped to reassure us. Now, all hope of any happy outcome vanished with him. On their 800-mile death march, the French troops looked to Vilnius as a beacon of hope. Now, abandoned by Napoleon, they will have to face the final horror alone. With the gates of Vilnius in sight, Napoleon's soldiers think they've reached safety. At those same gates, Paul Britton Austin relives the deadly gridlock of that day. And in no time at all, though, the most hideous pileup here in front of this gate, as more and more people came on, hundreds, thousands of them. But around this gate, there must have been among the most hideous sights you can possibly imagine. Collapsing outside the gates, Napoleon's aide, Victor Dupuis, is more dead than alive. But when he opens his eyes, he finds himself living a dream. Napoleon's men can't believe it. After the horrors of the march, they feel like they've entered a parallel universe. As one soldier reports, with a feeling of prodigious happiness, we saw glittering shop windows, well-dressed people, and above all, the restaurants. Ironically, men who survived Cossacks and the Russian winter die at the dinner table. They seem to have stuffed themselves with food and drink, and, and someone just died on the spot. You can't do that after starving for weeks on end. The team of archaeologists found gold coins at the gravesite, a clue to what happened next. Some person was quite rich in this grave, but unfortunately didn't save his life, money. A few coins are not enough to buy food. Soon, bread sells for its weight in gold. How desperate are Napoleon's starving soldiers? In a frenzy of hunger, some break into the home of a university professor who has a collection of medical specimens pickled in alcohol. The soldiers pig out on the human organs preserved in the jars. Scientists now suspect that thousands more did not die from hunger, that the soldiers brought disease with them on their death march. Dr. Yankowskis and his team have examined scraps of soldiers' clothing for microscopic evidence of what killed them. This fragment of textile I can recognize as the um, remains of socks. We are trying to take uh, the best preserved pieces of uniforms 
of clothing and to analyze them under microscope, first of all. So for the remains of lice, this could be indirect proof about presence of, uh, typh of epidemics of typhus. According to eyewitness accounts, typhus and dysentery pack the hospitals with victims. To cope with the overflow, monasteries are converted to hold the dead and the dying. But even here, in the shadow of despair, we find heroes. One of them is Edouard Deschi, the doctor Napoleon met on the road to Vilnius. In the midst of all the chaos and horror, it was one unselfish, devoted man who looked after his patients uh, with such devotion that he himself caught the typhus and died. By now, men are dying faster than their comrades can bury them. The bodies pile up, clogging the streets of a city bloated with death. The pitiful survivors of Napoleon's once grand army set out for France. For the unlucky ones left behind in Vilnius, it's the final betrayal, trapped in a city of the dead. When the Tsar's forces finally enter Vilnius, there's no French army left standing. And in a place where death rules, life takes on a terrible new agenda. An English observer with the Russians is shocked to see how the bodies of the dead are used to shield the living. All the broken windows and walls were stuffed with feet legs, arms, hands, trunk, and heads to fit the apertures and keep out the air from the yet living. When the Russians arrived in Vilnius, they needed these monasteries and hospitals for their own sick and wounded, of whom they had plenty, and they simply threw the uh, uh, French out of the windows. Archaeologists, like Dr. Jankowskis, find evidence of the unthinkable. We imagine quite vividly how it was, just piles of human bodies laying upon each other, being taken, being transported, like logs. With the grim irony of war, Russian troops hurled the bodies of Napoleon's soldiers into the trenches the French had dug themselves only a few months before. Even then, evidence suggests the soldiers' bodies were not left to rest in peace. Dr. Jankowskis found cuts in the victims' bones, a clue to what might have happened next. One of the possible explanations would be people were trying to remove valuable things, or let's say shoes, boots, from the bodies, so if boot was frozen, they were maybe trying to remove the sharp instruments with a big knife or even sword. Far from the icy mass grave, Napoleon has turned a cold shoulder on the hundreds of thousands who sacrificed their lives for him. But strangely, he remembers at least one of the victims. On a list of casualties, he recognizes the name of Dr. Deschi. He remembered him and his son and sent an order to Vilnius that the boy should immediately be sent back to France under escort and given a scholarship for his education. For Napoleon himself, the Russian campaign has been a cruel education. He writes it has taught him two lessons he will never forget. I've committed two errors. One to go to Moscow, the other to have stayed there too long. If 
From the sublime to the ridiculous is but a step. Up to the 6th of November, I was master of Europe. I am not so any longer. Less than two years after Napoleon leaves Moscow, Tsar Alexander leads an army into Paris and forces him to abdicate. Napoleon swallows the poison he has worn since Russia, but it has lost its potency, and he survives. Long before his decisive defeat at Waterloo, Napoleon had already met his fate in the frozen wastes of Russia. In fact, he lost 10 times more men in the Russian campaign than at Waterloo. After the retreat from Moscow, his grand army is only a memory, and his power fades with him. Less than nine years later, Napoleon will die on the remote island of St. Helena. In Vilnius, thousands are left to feed the worms in a muddy mass grave. But Napoleon will spend eternity in Paris, his final resting place among the grandest tombs in the world. As for his enemy, Tsar Alexander, he's as elusive in death as Napoleon found him in life. When the Tsar's grave is opened in 1926, it's empty. What happened to him remains a mystery to this day. And what about those who died for Napoleon's glory? Nearly 200 years later, their remains will finally be laid to rest with dignity at a military cemetery in Vilnius. Here they will join the ranks of soldiers from two world wars. But theirs may be only the first wave. So far, 3,000 bodies from Napoleon's lost army have been found. But if Russian accounts are accurate, there are another 34,000 bodies of Napoleon's soldiers in Vilnius yet to be discovered.